For Kramer Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is the former president of the Azanian People's Organization, Musibudi Mangena, to discuss his book titled, We Can Fix Ourselves, Building a Better South Africa Through Black Consciousness. So Mr. Mangena, what inspired you to write this book and why do you believe that we can fix ourselves as South Africans? Well, because we are not in a a good position as a country, we are in a bad state. Nothing seems to work. Uh, Whether you go to education or you go to health or our municipalities or the security situation that is the protection of our citizens, especially uh, women and children, we are not doing well at all. And it is not because we do not have the the skills uh, or the resources to do it but I believe it is because um, we are wounded, Uh, especially the the black majority who form about 90% of the population. We've been oppressed for so long that uh, many of us lack self-belief or love for ourselves and our people. It is an intangible thing uh, because if if you you don't have it, say you don't have enough self-worth respect yourself enough, you will not do your best for yourself and also your people. And if I'm a police woman or a policeman and crime is rampant, but I'm wearing my uniform, I'm going about and I don't seem to care. Uh, All I'm happy with is getting my salary and so on. Uh, There is a problem there. So I was moved by that to write this book that says we can sort ourselves out if only the black majority that controls the state from parliament to the executive, which is the cabinet, uh, it controls uh, the press, the treasury and so on, but yet uh, it is not able to do enough for its own people and we are deteriorating all the time. And I'm afraid that if we do not uh, experience a turnaround, then this country might go to the dogs and our our children and our grandchildren might not have a country to to call home. You also grew up into politics as a Black consciousness activist. What role do you think uh, the Black conscious can play in helping to solve the problems of our country, including the problems, Mr. Mangena, that you mentioned, besetting our health services? You know, uh, Black consciousness is uh, an intangible thing. Um, I I describe it as uh, some kind of Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi doesn't do anything, but uh, it enables uh, people who are covered by Wi-Fi to do whatever they would like to do. And and, and Black Consciousness um, sets out to read Black people of uh, inferiority complexes, the things that make them to hate themselves and their people and their culture and what they stand for, and emboldens them to to love themselves and their own people, uh, to serve their people to the best of their abilities. And hence my... uh, quoting of the likes of uh, Mampela Rampele, uh, what they did in the uh, Eastern Cape at Zanimpilo, building a clinic during those difficult times. But they were motivated by a love for their people and a belief in the worth of those people and that they deserve better. And so if the vast majority of us believe that we deserve better as a people, this country will be much better. And hence, a healthy dose of black consciousness is required, in my view, especially in the public sector. And I'm saying as one of the the suggestions uh, that the uh, civil service must be taught black consciousness, either when they enter or during uh, the workshops that they, they might have from time to time, um, and and that uh, particularly when they are to, to renew their contracts, um, their black consciousness credentials uh, must be assessed. Other countries have got different philosophies that guide them. 
uh, like in Singapore, for example, they have got their own philosophies that, that guide them uh, in, in what they do and how they behave in public office. And so if you, you have people in public service who don't care about their own people, who don't care about themselves and their work, and then you are not going to have um, the kind of uh, proper outcomes that we all desire. You also mentioned that black people don't support each other in local economic activity due to colonial mentality. Can you share a few suggestions uh, to rectify this issue? We are 90% of the population. We go to all these supermarkets. I'm in Polokwane at the moment. And I can assure you when I go out and walk the streets of Polokwane, nothing there belongs to black people who are the majority. And you go to the supermarkets, you go to the banks, to insurance companies that are everywhere. The black people that you will find are those sitting in the streets on a, a carton or something, selling tomatoes and sweets and so on. And behind them are these banks and these insurance companies and these supermarkets. And we go there with, uh, to go and buy and so on. And we don't feel anything. But even when we want to go out for a drink or for a, for a meal, we are quite happy to go to white establishments such as um, their restaurants and, and so on. And we don't feel that we should have uh, restaurants and supermarkets and banks and so on that we own. This, I'm saying, is a recipe for disaster for this country because then you have this 90% majority that is um, sulking, that is unhappy, that has no stake, serious stake in the economy of the country. That can only be a, disaster, a, a recipe for disaster. There is a resentment. There is a, it's boiling. It's inside. That's why in July last year, you had those um, uprisings, uh, whatever you want to call them, where people and they went out and they were destroying everything. It's insane. And so uh, unless uh, black people have a serious stake in the country, in the economy, and, uh, then we, we are doomed. But we can only also do that if we ourselves start serious businesses, including banks and, uh, and, and uh, supermarkets and farms and what have you, and support one another. And, and we shouldn't run away from um, the, the businesses that are owned by ourselves in the townships and villages to go somewhere else to go and uh, give other racial groups money. Uh, they might be happy with it, but I can assure you that is not, cannot be everlasting. It is not sustainable, that kind of arrangement. You also argue that uh, some join uh, political parties to gain access to state resources, which has led to what we call now in our country state capture. How can this should be resolved well by uh, as i said by people who are ethical people who love their own people and political parties must not be vehicles for uh, tenders for people to uh, acquire resources and so on i should get a tender as musibudi mangena because i can do engineer i can i should get a, a tender because i can deliver goods and services I am capable, I can do those things. As I say, political parties are constipated with a membership whose um, sole aim is to get uh, access to um, state resources. And therefore they join this political party, not just because they believe in the ideology or the philosophy or so forth of those political parties. That's why we, are, we find ourselves in this in a situation in which we find ourselves now, where there is state capture. So many people who occupy important positions in the state right up to the presidency are looking for nothing except to enrich themselves and, and not service for the population. So we, we find ourselves in a, in a, in a terrible state. Uh, and I, as I say, if we do not uh, get out of this, and they get a situation where 
politicians and political parties do their work to facilitate the development of their people, not to parcel out uh, legacy and tenders. And, and that results then in the kind of society where we have now. I was involved in political activity myself, and I do know that now our population does not respect politicians. They look at them as people who lie, who don't mean what they say, who only look after their own pockets and their own stomachs. And this cannot be healthy because there is no country in the world that can live without politicians. Politicians are a are fact of life and, and they should be there, but they must be ethical and they must be moral and they must uh, be um, geared them, themselves towards the service of their people and their country. And when discussing now the decay in our state-owned uh, enterprises, you say that we have no direction or desire to get somewhere better. How did China manage to get things right in this regard? Well, the, if you are in China and uh, they have a lot of state-owned enterprises, in fact, the vast majority of uh, their corporations are state-owned. They, they kill you, they hang you, or they, uh, you face the firing squad if you are corrupt. And they appoint people who uh, know what they are doing, who have got the, the, the right qualifications. The leader of China at the moment is an engineer. And many people in the uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party are uh, chartered accountants or engineers or, or people of that nature who have skills and the education to, to, to do right by their people, but also to run those state-owned owned enterprises properly. So why can't we have chartered accountants and engineers, etc., running our state-owned enterprises in an expert way so that um, uh, they are run properly. And, and if they are run properly, they benefit the population. They will be used also to train young people, especially budding engineers of all descriptions. You know, just look at what they will do at ESCOM and at South African Airways, as Transnet and so on. They need lots of artisans and lots of uh, engineers there. They could train them. And the Africaners did that. Uh, I don't want to talk much about them because amongst other things, they mix this with um, uh, racism and oppression against other people. But they were throats in Africans, you know, they were proud. They, they wanted to serve the folk. And so uh, the Chinese also are similarly orientated. They want to serve their country. They want to serve their people and therefore, they deploy people with the requisite skills uh, uh, to serve in state-owned enterprises so that those state enterprises are successful. Ours are collapsing under our watch because, you know, you go and get a, a, a primary school teacher to head South African Airways, uh, when in fact what she is trained, she was trained to do is to teach children, not to go and run a, a sleek and modern and fast moving business like an, a an airline. And the same with the municipalities. We should be having engineers and chartered accountants running our municipalities. They are very technical municipalities, are very technical things. I've seen uh, some of the things that are discussed in municipalities. You know, they discuss where the, the water pipes must go how thick they must be, electricity lines, where they should be, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And we do go and get people who know absolutely nothing, and especially teachers, and we make them municipal managers and so on. And in the process, almost all our municipalities are not working properly. So from what you've said, Mr. Mangena, is it fair to think that you are against cater deployment? No, no, not as, in, in, as a principle. You, you, you can have a cadre deployment. It is done in many countries, including in the United States. When the Democrats leave office, the Republicans come in and they appoint their own people, but only in, in politically sensitive positions. 
uh, at the top, but otherwise running of the mill, the most important technical things in the civil service are run by everybody. So you employ your cadres in few specific places. We have destroyed that as well. We have um, corrupted that by making it mean that you deploy your comrades whether or not they are capable. You deploy your uh, family members whether or not they are capable uh, or whether or not they are, they, they have got the qualifications for that job. That's where the corruption is. In our case, people are deployed in order to advance corruption not to do the work that is required in that particular facility or institution. Mr. Mangena, we are talking to you uh, after witnessing the release of the first report of the Zondo Commission. What do you think should be done uh, to those who are implicated in the report? I have read that uh, first part from the first way up, up to the end. I'm waiting for the second part. All 800 and something pages, uh, I've gone through them. Uh, it is scary reading, and it just shows that uh, we have destroyed uh, the resources that are good for us. And I'm, I'm glad that there are very clear recommendations uh, as to what needs to be done, at least in the first part that uh, I have read. Uh, the, the commission makes recommendation to the president and to the national Pro, uh, uh, prosecuting authority and, and the hawks and others to investigate and prosecute those people who are guilty of wrongdoing. Do, and I hope that we will make an example of them so that our children and younger members of our society will know that wrongdoing does not pay. And lastly, Mr. Mangena, what else does your book discuss uh, without giving our viewers too much? We should pay a lot of attention to the education of our children, but particularly the, 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 the black majority uh, that has turned its back to its own culture and languages. We should take care of the education of our kids starting at uh, kindergarten. Presently, only 30% of children in our country have access to early childhood development centers. And which means that at that age where 90% of their brain uh, is developing and it needs to be stimulated uh, through activities uh, that you get at uh, kindergartens, there is no such for 70% of our children which means that by the time they go to school, they have not been stimulate, stimulated sufficiently. There is also huge numbers of our children who suffer from malnutrition, which stuns them physically and mentally. And so if we have proper early childhood development centers, then we will be able to feed these children so that um, they are not mentally and physically stunted. And they, could, they will therefore be able to benefit from the education system. And we will produce adults in the future who will be, uh, be able to look after themselves, get benefit from education, and therefore benefit the country. But also that at kindergarten and at the, the foundation phase, that is grade one to, get to grade three, children must be taught in their home language because uh, that's the language they understand. Learning must progress naturally from the home, from the playground, into the classroom. And we should not insist that children must be taught at kindergarten and at uh, foundation phase in a language that is not their own. We are already putting obstacles in their journey uh, towards of, 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 of education. And if we deny them that foundation, because you see the, the, the most important thing to, to, for children is to learn the concepts in everything, in maths, in science, and et cetera. Not so the language. The language is only a vehicle. The most important thing is 
language, it's, it's, it's the concept. One plus one is two in English, in Afrikaans, in Isitosa, in Isipedi, in Chinese, in everything. And if you go to countries like China, their children are learning in their own languages from kindergarten right up to the end. The goods that we buy from China and then Korea and Germany and so on are manufactured and done and so on by people who don't speak English, speak their own languages. And so if we teach our children concepts in their own languages, the most important thing is concept, it's knowledge, not language. We can teach them English later on, but uh, we need to ensure that our children get a good foundation in education, starting at kindergarten and then primary school, and so it goes. There was former Azapo president, Mr. Buti Mangena, discussing his book titled, We Can Fix Ourselves, Building a Better South Africa Through Black Consciousness.